Merry Christmas, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this special Christmas edition of CBN News Today. I'm Ephraim Graham. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens is a classic story of transformation and redemption published in 1843. Today, the author's great-grandson, actor Gerald Dickens, is helping to carry on the family tradition with his one-man performance of that classic tale. CBN's Dan Rainey recently spoke with Gerald in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, where he shared his thoughts on the life and work of his famous ancestor. Charles Dickens is the author of one of the greatest Christmas classics of all time, A Christmas Carol. Today, Charles's great-great-grandson, actor Gerald Dickens, is helping to carry on the family tradition with his one-man performance of A Christmas Carol. We recently caught up with Gerald at the Inn at Christmas Place in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, where he shared his thoughts on the life and work of his famous ancestor. Now, what did you think when you started reading Dickens? Absolutely hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't abide it. Um, to be fair, it was at school. I was a teenager. We were giving Oliver Twist as a, a set text. The English teacher pointed out the beautiful language and the use of the plot devices and everything else. It meant nothing to me. Now, when did that start to change for you then? Well, through theatre. The Royal Shakespeare Company in, in Britain wanted to do a stage adaptation of one of Dickens' novels, and they chose Nicholas Nickleby. So I went along as the sort of archetypal grumpy teenager <laughs> and sat there and the play started five minutes. I was hooked. It was fabulous. Gerald also talked about Dickens' last book, The Life of Our Lord, a little known work he wrote to his children on the life of Jesus Christ. Something I love about this is that it's so personal. Yes. There are direct messages to his own children Absolutely. and future generations. You're absolutely right about um, the life of our Lord. It is so personal. And he wrote it very specifically as a guideline to his children. Take this, read it, understand the life of Jesus Christ. You won't go far wrong. Gerald also developed a particular fascination with the characters and themes in A Christmas Carol. Today, he performs his one-man show for audiences in the U.S. and Great Britain. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. I would assume your earliest experience with Christmas Carol was around the holidays yeah. just as a yeah. young boy. Absolutely. I remember laying in bed, my cousins were staying with us over Christmas, and their father, my uncle, read a Christmas Carol to us. And it didn't matter who the author was. It, it, it didn't matter to me that this was Charles Dickens. It was just a riveting story. And I was absolutely amazed by the ghosts and the travel. And, and what, one minute we're in London, the next minute we're out in the middle of the ocean, the next minute we're down, my, what is going on? And my biggest memory, and something I always try to get over when I do the show, is the amazement to me when Scrooge wakes up on Christmas morning and discovers he hasn't missed it. Are you there? Uh, yes, you. The what's the day, my fine fellow? He called to a young boy who was passing. Despite performing over 60 shows a year, Gerald says it never gets old. I know people are going to come and see the show because I'm the great-great-grandson of Charles Dickens. Of course, that's marketing. I understand that. As long as they leave the theatre or the venue or wherever it is, having seen a fantastic piece of theatre, I, I adore it, and I've never, ever, ever got tired of it or, or resent it or, or wish I didn't have to do it tonight or anything else. It just is so exciting every single time. And as Tiny Tim announced, God bless us, everyone. <laughs> The iconic reply, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, has been part of our popular culture ever since it first appeared in an editorial in the New York Sun in 1897. But many don't know that Santa Claus we know today is based on a real Christian saint. The 700 Club's Terry Mewson talked with an author who takes us back to the 3rd century A.D. with the true story of old Saint Nick. Take a look. For centuries, the legend of Santa Claus has captured the imaginations of children around the world. But the question is always the same. Is Santa Claus real? Author William Federer says there really was a Santa Claus. His name was Nicholas, a bishop in the 4th century AD who gave presents to the poor. After his death, stories of his generous life were embellished into legend, and eventually he became the Santa Claus we know today. William's book, 
There Really Is a Santa Claus separates fact from fiction with the story of Santa Claus and reveals the origins of other Christmas traditions. Please welcome to the 700 Club, William Federer. Welcome, so nice Terry, to have you here. Terry, great to be here. here. Well, the title of your book, There Really Is a Santa Claus. Tell us about the real Saint Nick. Well, Saint Nicholas is to the Greek Orthodox Church what Peter is to the West and Saint Patrick is to Ireland. So he's the most popular Greek Orthodox saint. And he lived around 280 AD is when he was born. This is during the first three centuries of Christianity when there's 10 major persecutions of Christians. Wow. Anyway, his parents died, left him with a large amount of money. And so he would go into town and help the poor anonymously. And a merchant in the town had gone bankrupt. And back then, if you didn't pay your bills, they'd take not just your house, they'd take your children. Oh sort of my. like the sex trafficking that goes on today. And the merchant thought if he could hurry up and marry his daughters off, the creditors couldn't take him. Unfortunately, he did not have money for a dowry, which was needed in that area of the world for a legally recognized wedding. Nicholas heard the problem late one night, threw some money in the window. Supposedly, it landed in a shoe or a stocking that was dried by the <laughs> fireplace, provided the dowry for the first second. And for the third daughter, the dad ran outside and caught him. And Nicholas made him promise not to tell. And so that's the origin of the tradition of secret gift giving on the anniversary uh -huh. of Nicholas's death which was December 6, 343 A.D. Talk a little bit. Let's, let's move from the St. Nicholas of old to the modern-day Santa. We, we talked about this, that there's, there is a, something he has in common with the mule and the elephant. <laughs> well, little things have been added along the way. Um, I was mentioning St. Francis of Assisi came up with the crest scene, the nativity scene. Ah. Um, but uh, Martin Luther starts the Reformation in Germany and ends the saints' days. And uh, the Germans liked the gift giving, so he moves all the gift giving to December 25th. And Martin Luther says, all gifts come from the Christ child. So the German pronunciation of Christ child is Chris Kindle, like kindergarten uh, Kindle. Yes. And so over the years, that morphed into Chris Kringle. I Anyway, see. it was the Dutch that brought the St. Nicholas traditions to New Amsterdam, which became New York. Uh, the, the Puritans and pilgrims did not celebrate Christmas. Uh, they said that the Sabbath is the holy day, but it was the Dutch that brought it to New Amsterdam. And uh, there, they changed the um, outfit from a bishop's outfit to Washington Irving's uh, Dietrich Hitt Knickerbocker's History yes. of New York to a Dutch outfit. Long trunk hose, leather hat, a belt and so forth, <laughs> stocking hat. And so it was um, then where Clement Moore does the, uh, the poem. He's a Hebrew professor in New York. And uh, that's where he sort of shrinks in size and a, a round little, a broad little face and a round, round little, little belly. belly. The chick would he laugh like a bowl full of jelly. <laughs> the stump of a pipe, he'll tighten his teeth, the smoke and encircled his head like a wreath. Of course, you wonder, where did he take up tobacco? That was yeah. from the American <laughs> Indians, you know. Yeah, but it anyway, was okay he, back then. <laughs> he still calls St. Nicholas. But then, as you mentioned, the elephant and the mule, Thomas Nast, N-A-S-T, he was the um, uh, illustrator for Harper's Weekly Magazine. And ah. he is the first one to put a North Pole sign behind the picture of Nicholas. And uh, this was sort of a little political jab at the South during the Civil War. And so the, the biblical theme was Jesus would return at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead, riding a white horse with the saints with him. St. Nicholas is a saint, so he would be riding back with uh, him, with Jesus. But in the Greek tradition, St. Nicholas comes back once a year for a little mini judgment. Ah. And he's riding a white <laughs> horse, but in Norway they didn't have horses, so he's riding a reindeer. And then you have the Lamb's uh, Book of Life and the Book of Works and the angels that help keep it. That turns into the elves keeping the Book of the Naughty and the Nice. And so the saints come from where? Heaven, the New Jerusalem, the Celestial City. That turns into the North Pole. And so you can see over Good the grief. years these biblical themes began. Yeah, but if begin you, to take the, on And then Coca-Cola obviously uh, had their, their artists <laughs> do Santa Claus drinking Coke. But you, you peel back and go back to the original guy, and he was a, a very godly man. Yes. It's, a, it's an amazing story, really, of the difference that one man can make, but also amazing is how that legend has come down over the years. The truth about his life, but then the legend that's grown into what many of us know today. You don't know the, the tip of the iceberg until you've read Bill's book. It's full of fascinating facts about the origins of Christmas traditions, and it would make a great holiday gift for someone on your list. It's called There Really Is a Santa Claus. It's available wherever books are sold. Thank you. It's always great to see you. Thank you, Terry. Great to have you here. Coming up, a spiritual renewal in a most unlikely place.
While millions of Americans will attend church on Christmas Day, things are a bit different in Europe, which has been called the new dark continent. Church attendance is extremely low, especially in the official state churches. But revival has come to some German churches through Muslim converts. Dale Hurd reports now from Berlin. Parts of Germany are among the most godless areas in the world. Polling shows that belief in God in the old East Germany is only 13%, but church attendance is growing here thanks to former Muslims from Iran. At the House of God's Help in East Berlin, Persian converts to Christianity have doubled the size of the congregation. Deaconess Rosemarie Gertz. It came like an unexpected summer rain. Suddenly, new people started coming every week and asked to be baptized. In the beginning, only five or six Iranians came. They were easy to spot, and we got to know them. And then over time, they brought their friends and neighbors. Germany has experienced a surge in Islam this year. Muslims conducted a nationwide campaign to give away Qurans in a country that has largely turned its back on biblical Christianity. But Iranian immigrants, or Persians, have already experienced the darkness and oppression of Islam in their native land, and they're hungry for the freedom and joy of Christianity. Michael asked that we disguise his face to protect his family in Iran. I met a few times with friends in Tehran, in an underground church in a flat, and there we spoke about Jesus, and we tried to do a Bible study sometimes without an actual Bible. All of the Persians we talked to accepted Christ in Iran and then had to either flee or risk prison or death. I was on my way to a house church meeting when I saw police outside the flat. So I didn't go in. And later, I called my mother. She said, the police were here looking for you. So my family helped me flee the country. When I was in Iran, I wanted to become a Christian, but it's really difficult to learn about Christianity in Iran. It's forbidden for a Muslim to become a Christian. It was really difficult. I had to leave my parents, so I lost my home and my family. Rosemary says the Persians were surprised to find so many Germans disinterested in Christianity. Most of them became Christians in Iran and know more about Christianity than you would expect. They're ahead of us in a sense because they have already been persecuted for Christ and they figured out pretty quickly that a lot of Germans are Christians in name only, and they're disappointed that Germans take religious freedom for granted. Some Germans are suspicious of the conversions because being baptized can help a refugee stay in Germany rather than be deported. So Sister Rosemary takes the Persian converts through a rigorous schedule of Bible classes. I did suspect that some of them just wanted to be baptized so they could get their residency in Germany. But that has turned out to be the case with only a few. In fact, some of them who've already been baptized have come back to our faith and baptism class for the fourth time. It's not known how many Persian immigrants have converted and joined churches in Germany, but it has become a nationwide phenomenon and is numbering in the thousands. At the House of God's help, it has reinvigorated the congregation. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Berlin. Up next, it's performed all over the world at Christmas, and now we bring you the amazing story behind Handel's Messiah. Choirs perform Handel's Messiah all over the world this time of year. But how much is known about this work and the man behind it? Mark Martin traveled to London to learn more about this devout Christian composer and his work that transcends time. For many, Christmas wouldn't be complete without witnessing or taking part in a performance of Handel's Messiah. From the Virginia Symphony in the U.S., to the heart of the Holy Land, Jerusalem. It is felt across the globe. To learn more about the gifted composer of Messiah, our journey takes us to Europe. German-born George Frederick Handel moved into this house on Brook Street in London, England in his late 30s. Handel considered himself an opera composer, but public interest was waning in England, and by 1741, 
A discouraged handle wondered if retirement was near. Some people do think that, that um, at this point he was, it was kind of like a, a career crisis, really, and that it's quite possible that he was thinking of returning to Germany. That's when this man, Charles Jennings, handed him the words or libretto of Messiah. Jennings, a literary scholar, carefully selected Old and New Testament scriptures documenting prophecies about the Messiah, Jesus' birth, death on the cross, and resurrection. The Christian message is, is in part also a response to the kind of growing interest in what is known as deism. Since the deists did not believe in the divinity of Christ, Jennings sought to counter that thinking. For Jennings, I think Messiah was a very personal passion, a very personal mission. Um, Jennings was a deeply religious man, um, a very committed Christian. We find uh, Jennings writing to another friend of his, uh, saying, uh, I've done this scripture collection for Handel, and I hope he will expend his best efforts on it so that it becomes his best oratorio, because it's certainly on the best subject. The subject is Messiah. Here is Handel's composition room, where he is believed to have composed Messiah. He wrote the oratorio in only 24 days. Many believe it was divinely inspired. One music scholar described the number of errors in the 259-page score as incredibly low for a composition of its length. Handel reportedly never left his house during those three weeks, and a friend who visited discovered him sobbing with intense emotion. After he wrote the Hallelujah Chorus, reports quote him as saying, I did think I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself. For Jennings and Handel, Messiah would be an evangelistic tool to share the gospel with the masses. They even made the controversial decision to perform Messiah in theaters instead of churches to reach a wider audience, including the performers themselves. Handel used secular singer-actresses to perform the solos, such as Susanna Maria Sibber, a woman with an adulterous past, but who was described as being able to penetrate the heart with her voice, when other more skilled vocalists could only reach the ear. He touches people on every possible level, whether it be on a spiritual level or, or musical level or dramatic level. There's something in Messiah for everybody, and, and of course, for an audience. If you look at the YouTube flash mob hallelujah choruses, you will see that hits are currently running at about 43 million. Now, I doubt if all those people are Protestant Christians. And if you just watch some of those flash mob hallelujahs, you can see in, you know, the people listening in the shopping mall and so on, you can see the change coming over their faces as they listen, and they are greatly moved. Performances were often benefit concerts to help release people from debtor's prison and provide for orphans in London's well-known Foundling Hospital. One scholar wrote, Messiah has fed the hungry, clothed the naked, fostered the orphan more than any other single musical production in this or any country. However, George Frederick Handel did not want the credit. At the end of Messiah, Handel wrote the letters SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, which means, to God alone, the glory. Mark Martin, CBN News, London. Finally, this Christmas Day, here are some stats to chew on. Each year during the holiday season, nearly two billion candy canes are made. Many people use the sweet treats to stir their hot chocolate or to hang on their trees. But that's not why they were originally made. Author Ace Collins explains. Now, Ace, just about every Christmas, most kids get candy canes, but uh, they're not this shape just because it's a handy hanger. There is some symbolism behind this, right? In 1670, a choir master in Cologne, Germany, had the same problem that choir masters have today. How do you keep children's choirs quiet during the service? Once they finish their song, they kind of want to pass notes, talk to each other, and he devised something that was a teacher's aid almost. He gave them a candy cane. The candy cane was white. And when he found it, it was straight, but he had the candy maker make it into a shaft, like the shaft of the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And he told him the candy cane at that particular point, the pure white color, represented the purity of Christ and the light of the world. And so he used it as a teaching aid, 
and that's where the candy cane originated. And that's what the candy cane looked like for many hundreds of years. As a matter of fact, if you look at a Christmas card from the 1880s, you'll see white candy canes. Mm. Driving didn't take place until the 1900s when a, a system was devised to paint individual stripes on candy canes. And the individual stripes, the three of them represented the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the red color represented the blood of Christ shedding on the cross. So if it started as a shepherd's crook, at some point it also got turned into a J. When the American candy maker put the stripes on it, he looked up on it not as a shepherd's staff, but as the J, the first letter in Jesus' name. So a lot of things to think about as you're enjoying one of the uh, staples of the Christmas holiday season. One of the wonderful things you can do is hand out candy canes to your friends with the message on them as to what it stands for and you essentially are giving it a track that people can eat. And that is all for this special Christmas edition of CBN News Today. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. Merry Christmas and have a great day.